Welcome to your College Bound Kid, a podcast for parents, college counselors, students, and anyone who wants a weekly deep dive into the world of college admissions. My name is Vince, and I've been doing admissions since 1989 and college counseling since 1998 in California. I'm Lisa, and I'm a clinical psychologist and college counselor. I have a daughter in college, a daughter in high school, and a son in middle school. After 30 years in Chicago, we recently moved to North Carolina. My name is Mark. I'm a college coach in Atlanta and the parent of two daughters, Karis, a graduate of Davidson College, and she is the founder of the Spanish tutoring company, SpanishHelpToday.com. And Joy is a wellness coach at the Kenan Flagler Business School at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And I'm so blessed to be able to work alongside both my beautiful daughters at School Match for You, a college counseling firm that I founded in 2010. Good afternoon, friends. I am coming to you from San Luis Obispo, and I'm staying in a hotel with beautiful mountains I'm looking at here. I'm having a fantastic time here in the amazing state of California. So I spent six days in San Diego, where I got to tour San Diego State University, University of California, San Diego. University of San Diego, and then also Point Loma, and then I headed to Chapman, where I toured Chapman, and I got to stay in Costa Mesa, which is just outside of Newport Beach area, which was fantastic. And then next I went to Irvine and got to tour University of California at Irvine. So I'm basically doing about a school a day. And then I was supposed to do UC Santa Barbara, but I, like a rookie, didn't stay close enough, so I'll hit that on my way back. But right now, tomorrow morning, 9 a.m., San Luis Obispo. So we're going to do deep dives on the majority of these schools for you. Uh, I just think these schools are pretty phenomenal, and I want to share with you the things I'm learning. So I'm not going to promise all of them, but most of the schools look for spotlights coming up in the not-too-distant future. Some of them will be in 2024, and then some of them will be in, in 2025. And I just want to give a shout out to several people. Stacy Boodman, she she is a college counselor. Uh, she's in San Diego. She hosted us, and we had an amazing time. There were like twenty to twenty five of us. You know, originally we were just going to do like five minutes of Q and A. So five minutes turned into ninety minutes and food refreshment. It was amazing. So we have two more events this Thursday. Redwood City, love to see you there. And also Sunday the twenty second. Santa Monica. And I'll be joined by Susan Tree and Vince Garcia for that one. So you can still sign up. Just go to your collegeboundkid.com forward slash events. And we hope to see you there. I want to give a shout out to so many of our listeners who have hosted me. Just in addition to those receptions, many of you have had me in your homes. I've also got a chance to meet some of my students. And I'm feeling this California love. So I, I'm already saying to my family, you know what? We got to do this trip again as a family trip. Now, my wife has MS, so she's probably not going to be up for it. Uh, but Karis was supposed to accompany on me this trip. And my, both my girls are itching to come back. It's really worth doing. Just start at San Diego. All, go all the way up the coast uh, for California. The, the landscape is just breathtaking. I'm feeling totally invigorated, and I'm excited, and I'm excited, and I'm excited. So today... Um, I'm going to do something a little different. It's a brand new exercise I've just started doing with my students. Very excited about it. Uh, some of my students who listen and regularly this podcast, if you're like, snap, how come I haven't heard about this? It's because it's a brand new idea. It's a thought popped in my mind one day and I've just started doing it and I'm really liking it. And so I want to share it with the broader audience. I think it's a great exercise for p parents to do with their kids as you sort of think your way through this college process. So I'm going to share this exercise with you. I'm really excited about it, and I can't wait to get into that. But before we do, I want to mention our three webinars are live. They're up now, and you can, I mean, we had six, but three of them, the recording worked. And so you can check out the Andy Strickler recording. You can check out the one Lisa and Linda did on, on parents handling stress of this process. And you can also ha check out the homeschooling one. All three of those are up and ready for viewing. Just uh, They're under the interview tab. I think it's like, 199, 200, 201, if I remember correctly. Um, so they're there for you to access. Also, the interview that I'm doing right now with David Graves, 
Um, that should be up by Thursday, probably by Tuesday. It's already been uh, submitted off to our sound engineer. I wanted to get that whole two-hour interview to you in case that's a school you're thinking about. They do have a 10-15 deadline. I don't want you to hear the final fifth segment like October 12th and be like, snap, I got like three days to apply. So that whole uh, episode interview should be up. We've been doing a better job with that. The Andy Strickler one, all seven parts should be up. Uh, we've had the the one in this episode, the last part, part five, Sarah Lovely in the Arts. I don't know if you know this, but that's been up for three weeks um, at yourcollegeboundkid.com. So I know sometimes it's frustrating for people, and I understand this, to have to go find a segment and find the timestamp and have to do that two, three, four, sometimes even five times, five different episodes to hear the whole thing. So having the whole entire thing in one audio file, I understand the the value to that. And so you can find that information just under your College Bound Kid under the interview tab. So like I said, today I'm going to share a creative idea I'm very excited about that I've just started doing and I love what I'm learning and I think it's great for students and families. And then we'll have the last part of Vince Garcia's interview with Sarah Lovely on admissions and the arts. All right, so this is the exercise. So what I've done, and I take this from the book I wrote in 2016, you know, I went through at that time, I identified over 30 things that can be drivers of a search. What I mean by drivers of a search, it means this is something that's so important to you that it's a high priority to you when you're building a college list. And so, you know, at that time I had more than 30, but I've whittled it down to 26, 27. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you what the, these these are. And I'm share them in alphabetical order. It's not an order of importance because, you know, I'm all about the custom fit. One thing could be super important to somebody else, a complete non-factor to another person. But this is the exercise, and I want you to consider doing this with your student. So you have your student take like these 26 things and rank them according to what is most important to you. And then parents also do it. And then you just sort of have a conversation about these things. Um, and if you're doing this in 10th grade, even us, even at the start of 11th, after you've maybe before you've stepped foot on many campuses, go back and do it again after you've done heavy visitation and see how it changes. So what's the purpose of this? It makes you think about things that you haven't thought about before. It makes you think about things and put them in context and say, how important is this to me? All right. I feel I'm getting a little abstract. I feel like I'm getting a little theoretical. Let me dive in and tell you what they are, and I think it'll make more sense. But the bottom line is, I feel you can take the essence of what you're looking for when building a college list and put them into these 26 categories, okay? Almost everything fits neatly into one of these, and I'll say a little bit more about that later. So, um, and I'll tell you what, I'll put these in the show notes too, so you have them there, but if you want to write them down, that's also good. All right, so the first is the area surrounding the college. So for some people, that's extremely important, right? Maybe you want to be close to a city. We hear this all the time, you know, or it could be other things that you're looking for. So there's some things you'll, you'll see we won't list on here. Like I'm not going to say hospitals. I'm not going to say an international airport, but that might be very important to you that there's an international airport or a hospital close by. All right. So, or lots of stores or shopping or restaurants. So First is the area around the campus or surrounding the college. And I know I'm not going to get exact whether that's the immediately like quarter mile, one mile, five miles, but you get it. You can individually decide how far the area around the campus extends in your evaluation. Next, campus beauty. Campus beauty. How important is it to you that the campus is beautiful? Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So for one person, that's, you know, something completely different from somebody else. All right, but campus beauty. The next is what I call campus setting. Now, campus setting, I, I basically see five main settings, large city, small city, suburban, college town, rural or remote. This is a very important uh, feature and factor for people. So campus setting would be the third thing on the list. All right, the next thing is career outcomes. That's important to a lot of people, right? And by career outcomes, I mean a lot of things, okay? I'm talking about things like first year, pay, mid-year pay, 
Do you get placed into your areas of interest or is it just a job? That kind of thing. Results. All right. Next, we have class size. Say no more. We all know what that means. Small, large, midsize. Okay. Class size. All right. Next, we have, I'm putting, I'm calling it college rankings, but you really could mix college rankings in here. Also with like prestige, they all kind of go together. College rankings, prestige, selectivity. They're all, you know, similar. They're slightly different, but I'm grouping them together. How important is that? Okay, next we have community oriented versus residential. So it's really residential versus commuter. Residential versus commuter. That's extremely important to some people. Is it primarily school where people live on campus or are they commuting? Basically, all of these things are factors that for some people, they're very important. And maybe for somebody else, they're a non-factor. But part of building a call this is thinking through the process and figuring out what's important to you. So the exercise is for the students to go through and rank all these from 1 to 26, which is really hard. Takes makes you think a lot, parents to do it, and then have a conversation with each other. Next, cost affordability, right? Can I pay for it? Is it affordable? Is it within budget? Cost affordability. Not the cost of the school, but what you actually pay. Net price, net cost. Next, distance from home. Um, these are all things that over the years, many, many people have told me are very important to me. So do you want to be really far, really close, in between? And then, you know, for some people, they may have, like, for example, Joy. She, got, she was recruited by Oldthorpe University for basketball. And they, re they recruited her... I'd say that school and Virginia Wesleyan probably recruited her the hardest. But when she found out it was 48 minutes from our house, that did not matter. They had been to multiple games for her, high school and travel, and we'd been over there multiple times. 48 minutes to house, she's like, uh-uh, you're not popping up on me. So distance can home may mean too close. It can also mean too far. Distance from home. Diversity is next. Now, diversity is broadly defined. Okay, I know the first thing everybody thinks of is race, but it can be lots of types of diversity, right? It can be socioeconomic diversity. You know, it can be religious diversity. It can be geographic diversity. It can be international diversity. It can be perspective diversity, ideological diversity, political diversity. So diversity. All right, the next is experiential learning. So we're talking about things like teaching opportunities, research opportunities, co-ops, internships, study abroad. Learning by doing, experiential learning. Next is facilities. So we're just going through these alphabetically. How important are facilities to you? And for some people, facilities also means architecture. So it's kind of a combo there. Next, we have food, and that's quality food, and that could be both on campus and off campus, but we're talking food. All right. Next, we have friendliness. Is it warm and inviting? Next, we have graduation rates. And that could also include retention, retention and graduation rates. All right. Now, the next one, I, I could have put this together with prestige, but to me, it's a little different name recognition. So, in fact, I'm thinking of a family I'm working with right now. They're not so concerned about their prestige, but they want to know that they want people to have heard of this school. Their view is that helps them in the job market. Their view is you probably have a bigger alumni network. So I am differentiating name recognition from prestige selectivity rankings. I made that its own category. I know that's debatable. Okay, next is like nature and green spaces. So that can be very, very important to people. And you could call that campus beauty, but I thought it warranted its own category. <laughs> next is overall academic excellence. Okay, overall academic excellence. And then the next is political climate. Political climate. What's the political environment? And that could be everything from mostly red, mostly blue, purple, you know. Um, could also uh, imply international and global awareness for global issues, political climate. Then we have safety. Say no more. We know that's important, especially to parents. Next, we have school size. Okay. Oh, I left one out. Religious environment, the religious affiliation. So sometimes people really do want to go to something related to their denomination. Uh, not that common, but for some people who feel very strongly about that, you know, Church of Christ, Disciples of Christ, 
Jewish school, Catholic school, religious affiliated schools. All right. Then we have single gender versus co-ed. Okay. For some people, that's very important. Mostly the single gender people, they can feel passionate if that's what they're looking for. Then we have sports school spirit. Now, there's really two things. I combine them into one because sports, we know what that is, right? The rah-rah, everybody getting pumped for the game with the tailgating and <laughs> cheering, jeering crowds and all the school spirit that comes with that. But there's another kind of school spirit, which is like school pride. I'm proud to go here. There's a positive attitude of the kids have about the school. All right. Next, we have strength in my major. So that's a differentiated strength in my major from overall academic excellence. Some schools may not be as strong overall, but in a particular major, they're just stupendous. And for some people, it's really important that a school is really strong in their major, but doesn't necessarily have to be strong overall. Other people, the overall thing is more important. Next, we have student support. And that's a pretty broad category because I don't have like one here for like learning differences, but that's kind of all included. So school student support can be anything from support for learning differences, good advising. Okay. It can mean strong academic support center, multicultural support. There's a lot in there with student support. And then last we have weather, weather. So the idea, and it's really, really hard, but you go through and force yourself to force rank these from one to 26, what's most important to you. And then have parents do it and then have a conversation with each other about really what really matters. And then if you're doing this early on in your process, after you've got a bunch of visits under your belt, try it again and see how your order changes. Because it does tend to change, by the way, from, from doing this for a while. Once The more campus visits you've had, this is a self-discovery process. The more you get to know yourself, the more you get to figure out what you're looking for, the more you get to see what's out there, your view will change on a lot of these things. What this forces you to do is to think about things that, in actuality, they're quite important to you, but you might not have put much thought into whether they're important to you. And it's just kind of a good way to think your way through the process. And once you do that, not only will it help you get to know yourself better, but it will also help you to evaluate schools a little better. So it's kind of an exercise I'm really excited about. The students that have filled it out for me so far, I'm really learning a lot from them. And so far, no complaints. And so I want to pass it on to you. I'll put it in the show notes, and hopefully you'll find it as helpful to you as I'm finding it helpful for me understanding the students I work with. And now this week's interview with a special guest. Friends, in the final part of Vince's interview with Sarah Lovely, Sarah starts out giving advice for film majors, and then Vince adds some additional insights for film majors. Sarah talks about what you can learn from art supplements. Sarah talks about art scholarships and opportunities for visual artists. Sarah talks about the art student recommendation. Sarah talks about all the places in the application to show your artistic interest. And then Vince puts Sarah on the hot seat, and he asks her a question that she used to ask when she did admissions at NYU. Listen and enjoy. Film. Talk about film. Oh, yeah. So film. Okay. Yeah. So I wanted to put this sort of in a different category because I think that so much of, uh, for a lot of film, you know, there is sort of like film production versus film studies certainly is. But if we're talking about a BFA in film, it's usually a BFA in, in film production. But within that, there is nuance within each program. So there, a lot of these schools are looking for storytelling. And so usually there is some hefty additional writing that needs to be submitted. Um, usually they're not looking for a full length feature film or anything like that. You know, there, there is a creative portfolio, which usually does include either images. So it could be similar to a visual arts portfolio or a video, um, you know, usually not just like a demo. Usually it's like a short film if they're that's what they're looking for but a lot of it for film programs in my experience is about how how do you tell a story um and therefore sometimes there's quite a bit of additional writing that sh you where you need to show a narrative structure or you need to 
tell a story about yourself. Um, so I would definitely be prepared to have to do that as a film student. And also, um, a lot of film programs might look for artist statements as well. And so it's similar to similar to visual art, but different enough because they're really looking for how, how do you, how do you find an arc in a story? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they're not looking for perfection. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. And I think, I think that, that also helps the student think about if you're trying to develop stories you, do you do you write for the literary magazine? Do you do you right. do you know Write Girl, which is here in LA, where Amanda Gorman rose out oh. of that as as a poet. So if they see you taking advantage of you know opportunities where they're where you're always developing stories, the interesting story. Sometimes I also encourage students when I hear that they their life story is, has a story that's not often told. So if a student is trans or a trans person of color or the student has an interest in drag, that that's a story that you're not hearing from, from, uh, from everyone. And like you said, telling an interesting story is often half the battle in that process. Yes, totally. And so, so many of our stories come from our own personal experience. And I remind students a lot that our, you know, our own personal perspectives are so obvious to us, but they're actually not obvious to other people, you know, yes. so to, yes. to work with somebody to help bring that out, or a lot of high schools offer creative writing programs. Um, that's not necessarily personal narrative writing, but it's adjacent to that. Absolutely. And I was, I was glad to hear, I mean, there's a lot of opportunities in all of these spaces for expensive support. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Summer course. programs and, <laughs> and, and, you know, film camps, you know, all these stuff, but it, initially it's about building skills and you can do, you can build those skills at community college or going to a summer program at NYU. Totally. There's there are resources and there's often a lot of financial aid. So if you, you want to have an experience, you know, at, at Carnegie Mellon, if you, if you go in early and you look at the details and you apply, but whatever that deadline is for scholarships, you might be one of those people that they, they think has, has something that's interesting and, and will provide you with more resources and opportunities to gain and get a sense of your own talent. Yeah. Now in this last, part, we're going to talk a little bit about there are a lot of talented students and they want to share their talents. They don't necessarily want to major in the area. How does a student navigate that process? How do they share their talent? Um, if they're not going to major in music, should they, re they reach out to the music professor? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those kind yeah, of it's such a yes, so great. I I work with a lot of students particularly now, but also when I was at Walnut Hill who didn't necessarily want to study their art f as their primary area of focus, but who were still very much artists at heart and um I again really encourage students to embrace who they are as artists in the admission process because I think that there is a lot to love about artists for all the, you know, all the qualities that I cited earlier. Um, so one of the first things that I do, um, if you're, if you're a student who is looking for a vibrant arts culture within the context of a more kind of traditional college is to look at their, first of all, look at their arts offerings, but also look to see how that school embraces the arts in the admission process. So for example, an art supplement for a student who has been really heavily involved in the arts is can be a wonderful addition to their applications. And usually what that looks like for performing artists is just kind of a, a highlight reel almost, you know, of themselves as a performer. Um, and just make sure that you can tell it's you, you know, to include individual yeah. <laughs> work, not just to, here's me in the back as a tree, you know. And, and um, so that, and for a, for a visual artist or a, a film student um, portfolio, you know, including portfolio 
pieces is great. So a lot of schools, if a school has an art supplement, it means that they are really sort of actively looking for artists. And I would say um, a lot of schools, you know, I think about Wake Forest, University of Richmond, Beloit College, Muhlenberg, they have uh, scholarships specifically for artists at Connecticut College. You know, I encourage students if they are, are somebody who, you know, it, for whom this is appropriate to to go for it with those, you know, Skidmore um they, these schools have wonderful opportunities for artists and you can get some money. Who doesn't love that? Right. Um, yeah, yeah. So yes, the arts. So the arts supplement, I feel like is the most kind of obvious way to showcase yourself as an artist, but you could also, that many schools allow you to get an additional recommendation from an arts teacher. So I, you know, I would encourage students to do that shows them kind of in a different dimension than a classroom teacher. Um, the activity section of the common app, which I know this podcast has gone into great detail about the activities section recently. That's a great place to showcase who you are as an artist, you know, and what your, what your involvement has been in the arts. And the additional information section is a great place to put that to, you know, to, if you write a really good supplement, you could include that in the additional information section, or you could simply just include something about yourself or in the main essay about who you are as an artist. Um, Interviews, great place to bring up your arts. So there's so many opportunities to do it. And I know I have students who say, you know, well, I'm, I don't want them to think I'm only an artist. And it's like, well, that's, I don't think they're going to do that. (laughs) (laughs) You know, so um, uh, yeah. So lean into it. Yeah. Especially if the talent is significant. Yes. You want them to see your strengths. And if that's one of your significant strengths and you don't emphasize it, that's a missed opportunity on your part for sure. Yes, absolutely. And yeah. Would you recommend if they're not majoring to reach out to people in departments still? Uh, yes. So I d- definitely, um, because it. I think that going back to fit, right, you still want to know if this is the right fit school for you and if the arts programs are an important piece of what you're looking for, even if you have no interest in majoring in them, understanding, you know, you can reach out to faculty, you can sit in on a class, you can um, talk to students such yes again faculty are so accessible okay great great so now we transition into the final piece and this is i don't i don't know if you've heard on the podcast but um mark when he interviews people he has these this random questions uh section yes (laughs) and and the the guests are always like oh okay so your first random question there's going to be two is um if you could do anything else what would that have have been? Oh, so you're asking me the question that I yes. asked at NYU, <laughs> Vince. <laughs> if you woke up tomorrow and could be a college counselor, I feel like I would have done so. So this is totally random. I feel like I would have loved to do something in like, I would have loved to be a physical therapist or something. Because it's still, you know, working with people, but, um, you know, the healthcare industry in some way, I think that would have been kind of fascinating. So maybe that's me kind of channeling my original, I was going to be a doctor when I first went, went to, to college, but oh, that okay. blew up, okay. you know, when I, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe a writer, maybe a writer, but I feel like a writer is too, too adjacent to the arts. So I'm going to say physical therapy. There you go. Okay. Well, that's a big surprise. <laughs> and talk about um, a time that someone surprised you in a positive way and it's it's all you always when you think about being surprised and encouraged in a positive way you always think about this experience oh my gosh okay hold on I gotta think about this for a second I would say so this is a little bit random but one of the one of the things I think about is when I worked at Walnut Hill I know this has to do sort of with my professional life. But I remember that we had all these different offices. Our our college counseling team was spread out sort of like all over the place on campus. And I went to our head of school and I said, I have an idea for how to make us all one office. And I sort of approached him about how to transform a space 
And I just didn't think that he was going to say yes. And he came back to me right away and he said, okay, yep, we're going to do it. And he, um, (laughs) he made, he, we worked together to create this space that was so much more conducive to being able to collaborate and so much more welcoming for students. And it was one of those moments. And he and I talked about it later on where he called it, I think it was like Kaizen. So it's like small changes that can be made to create a big impact. And, you know, this had to do with space, but it can be sort of anything. And I feel like it's a lesson that I've taken with me where it's like, well, just ask you know, um, or be, or sort of think outside the box or be curious. And so, yeah, that's great. That's And great. I got myself a new office. So. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. Congratulations. Yeah, and then the you. last question, question, I want to go back to one of the important aspects of your commitment to the arts is social justice. Yeah. Um, if you could talk about an opportunity or something, an organization that really does that, that you would like to promote here, I w- we'd love to hear about that experience. Or, or, or what is a way that that an organization that really helps artists in this particular process? Maybe you have a recommendation there. Well, the first one that comes to mind is rehabilitation through the arts, and um, okay. it, it's really focused on kind of the, the in, this intersection between criminal criminal justice and the arts. So there's um, there are I'm sure other organizations that do that, but I have a particular interest in ones like that because it helps people who have a story that has sort of landed them in a difficult place to tell their story or to under or to, you know, educate others um, in a way that is really meaningful and productive to them, but also to the community around them, I think. So, you know, there are other organizations that do that aside from rehabilitation through the arts, but they're one of the ones that I can think of in the top of my mind probably because of the work that I've done in the past. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Well, Sarah, I want to thank you for your massive amount of time that you <laughs> that dedicated so to, to this. Digest. <laughs> and if, if people wanted to contact you, how would they find you? So you can go to my website, lovelycollegecounseling.com. That's great. Yeah. And um, thank you again for your time. And I'm sure we'll, we'll get some questions back. Yeah. I'm always happy to talk to people about the arts and admission. I love it. Great. Great. Friends on Thursday's episode, we are continuing our series with Andy Stricter on athletics and we're getting close to the end, but we're with part six of seven. And then Kevin Newton takes one more question from a listener about international schools. And then we continue our interview with David Graves looking at the University of Georgia, part two of five, and our interview is our college spotlight. Friends, colleges are so different, and as I go up the coast of California, I see how different they are. I just want to encourage you to trust your instincts when you visit a school. Trust your instincts. You know, one of the questions that was asked by a parent at our San Diego event was how can I get my kid off this fixation with prestige? And so we kind of talked about that from a lot of different angles. But one thing that popped into my head, I was thinking about a student from Oklahoma, and the mom's a listener, so she's going to know when you know I'm referring to when she hears this. But she was really fixating on prestige. And then she started visiting some schools, and she realized, snap. Fit and match actually matter more than prestige because that school, you know, (laughs) that had all the sizzle, a little disappointing when I visited it. And this school that I wasn't even sure if I wanted to visit, wow, sparks were flying. So I really encourage you to trust your instincts on college visits. A lot of times you may not even know what it is that's creating that gravitational pull, that either repulsion like a magnet or that attractive magnet. But trust your instincts and never forget, college is a match to be made and not a prize to be won. See you on Thursday, friends. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. If you find this podcast helpful, 
please follow us and you'll get every single episode as soon as it is released. If you're interested, there are a few ways you can really support our podcast. You can click the share button and send it to your friends and acquaintances. You can help us pay our staff and our expenses by donating on our website. You can write a review for us on Apple or Spotify. I'm the producer of the podcast, but we have a fantastic team of 15. Shout out to our co-host, Dr. Lisa Ruff, Dr. David Williams, Linda Depker, Susan Tree, Vince Garcia, and Julia Esquivel. And to our substitute co-host, Sylvia Borgo. Our sensational sound engineer is Nemanja Motvich. Our amazing music is from Victor Allen Weeks. Marketing designs from Kimberly Blass. Lily Parikh manages our Instagram. Our image editor is Talha Khan. Joyce Ducker does our website episode updates. And our webmaster is Stylianos Dimitru. And if you want to have a coaching session with Lisa, Linda, or me, just text me at 404-664-4340. If you have a question you want us to answer, or if you have a recommended resource or article you think we should discuss, just send it to questions at your collegeboundkid.com. Our favorite method is for you to record your own voice at speakpipe.com forward slash YCBK. By the way, check out our website where you'll find lots of content that is not on any podcast app. Our website is your collegeboundkid.com. If you want to learn about other hot admissions topics, follow us on Twitter at YCBK Podcast. We think of you as our listening family, and we look forward to meeting again with you every single Monday and Thursday.